On October 31st, 1517, Professor Martin Luther circulated 95 theses for debate among religious scholars. These theses questioned the marketing practices of a man named Johann Tetzel, who was traveling throughout Germany selling indulgences. Many Christians believed that after a person died, he or she went to purgatory as a time to cleanse themselves from their earthly sins before they were released to heaven. Tetzel taught in, that an indulgence brought by a living relative could free a dead person from purgatory and send him or her straight to heaven. Luther was not alone in criticizing Tetzel. Many religious leaders and common citizens were opposed to him. Tetzel was used to some heckling and booing wherever he went. For some reason, however, Luther's writings and preaching against Tetzel were more effective than others. The 95 theses were translated from Latin into German. Then they were published and distributed widely. Tetzel's sales of indulgences began to be seriously affected. The whole thing would have, been, would have blown over with a whimper, except that Tetzel had powerful friends. Conflicts stirred higher and higher. Many attempts were made to end the conflict. Tetzel and Luther even met in private to try and constructively reach an agreement. All of these attempts failed. A storm was growing that threatened to destroy the church and the political stability of Europe. On April 17, 1521, at 4 o'clock p.m., Luther appeared on trial before Charles V. Charles was from Spain, and he was the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Luther was asked to take back what he said in his many writings. Luther politely refused. For three days, the political leaders of Germany tried to negotiate with Luther and avert a crisis. But Luther became over more adamant that he would not negotiate. It became apparent that Luther was going to be condemned. Charles V had made a promise to Luther. He would be allowed 21 days to safely return to his home. In exchange, Luther had to promise not to preach or write anything during that time. Charles held to his promise, and so did Luther, almost. Unknown to Luther, a plan had been made to kidnap him while he was on his way home. The night of May 3, 1521, Luther and two friends were traveling by wagon through a forest. Suddenly, four or five armed horsemen plunged out of the forest and demanded Luther. The armed men snatched him from the wagon and drung him half stumbling, half running around a bend in the road. Once out of sight, they released Luther, put him on horseback, and escorted him to Wartburg Castle, that gigantic fortress of Frederick the Wise, Luther's longtime political supporter, except that not even Frederick knew Luther was there. Luther was hidden in Wartburg Castle for nearly a year. He was rarely allowed out. When he did go out, he was disguised and told to pretend to be Sir George, a young knight Luther didn't like his captivity. While the ten months in hiding turned out to be the most productive in his life, he was also deeply depressed and often very sick. We meet Luther at work in his secret room in the castle, as his friend and former confessor, John Stoppitz, arrives for a visit. That idiot, Karl Stott, I don't know what's the matter with him. He should know better than all this stuff. Jeez. I told you I didn't want to be bothered. Go away, you filthy maggot. Martin, oh. Martin. Is that any way to treat an old friend? Father, forgive me. I didn't know. Come on in. Please. Can I send for some refreshment? It's no, great to see no. you. No, oh. no. I can't stay. Really? You know, it's been a long time since you posted the 95 theses on the church door. Yes, it has. Four years to the day, in fact. Never would have guessed this would have gone from a request for an academic debate to this, this mess that we're in now. Same oh. old Martin, full of changing the church, boldly confronting the authority and not thinking about the consequences. Maybe the Pope is right. You are like a wild boar charging through the laws and doctrines of the church and stirring up unrest. Oh, well, the church and the German people, they needed to be stirred up, Father. Both are ignorant. The church thinking it can sell God's grace and salvation and, well, the people thinking God hates them and wants to send them all to hell. This just can't go on. Martin, I agree, I agree. But things have gotten out of hand. I find it more than just a little ironic that the very people that you introduced to a loving and gracious God are now acting anything but loving and gracious. Yes, and we have Karlstadt and his followers to thank for that. They've just, they've gone too far. I never intended for monks to leave the cloister or, or priests not to wear vestments. 
And as far as communion practices, I, I haven't even thought about changing anything there. I wanted peaceful changes, changes based upon, upon scripture and reason. Yes, yes. But whenever there is radical change, there will always be misunderstanding, Martin. And speaking of misunderstanding, your scholar, a theologian, why are you dressed <laughs> like this? Yeah, well, since I've been under the ban of excommunication, Prince Frederick has me hiding here and wants me to dress so that nobody will recognize me. If I leave the castle, I'm supposed to tell them I'm Knight George. Now, I understand why he's done this. He just doesn't want me to be killed on sight. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. <laughs> Let us pray that eternity has not come too soon for you, Martin. Well, oh, I even have to carry this, this ridiculous sword here. The only sword I need is one sword, and that's, that's the word of God, Father. Be careful how you wield that sword. God's word is sacred. It should never be used to harm people. Only protect and defend. But that's what I'm trying to do. Protect and defend the people against the abuses of the church and that ass that's the head of it. When popes become self-indulgent, they soon become corrupt. And, and the whole church soon follows down the same path. Yes, but who's to decide what is corrupt and what isn't? You? Me? The king? The pope? Hmm. The common man? Who has the truth, Martin? Scripture has the truth. Scripture is the truth. And when any authority goes against Scripture, those who know better are obligated to stand against the falsehood, to root out and destroy the evil it perpetuates. Yes. But there's not just one way to interpret Scripture. There are good Christian people who can read the Scripture and they'll all have different conclusions. Yes. And appealing to conscience doesn't always work. Conscience can be corrupted by sin. And who knows what is right and true and just. <laughs> so at last you too believe the Pope can hear, huh? <laughs> well, this may be true, but when comparing the opinions of the church's trained leaders with the opinions of the common man, which is most likely to tr speak the truth? The one who follows what the scriptures say. Oh, we're going in circles here. I, I give up. I don't know. Uh, I don't have all the answers, Father. I never will. But while I've been in this exile, I, I have managed to translate the New Testament into German so that our common people now can at least read the scriptures for themselves. And in that process, I've learned much about our gracious God. But I still have so much to learn and so much to teach. And, and yet I can't do it by just sitting around here in this castle. So what do you intend to do? Since you have on your knight's armor, are you planning to go out among the people? I have to. No choice. I have to correct the misunderstandings of some of our leaders. There have been mistakes, yes. Students at Wittenberg University, they're smashing images. They're, they're rioting. They're breaking out over some of the misguided reforms. Priests, nuns, and monks are marrying, but I'm not so sure that's not a good thing. I need to think that one through. What about the violence? It may only increase, Martin. The Antichrist is to be broken without the hand of man, Father. Violence will only make him stronger. I've said in my letters, pray, preach, but do not, do not fight. Yes, but I fear the people may not listen. History is full of drastic change and none of it has ever come at a cheap price. It has been very costly in terms of violence, death, and destruction. Yes. How do you intend to control those who will implement these reforms? <laughs> I doubt I can control anything anymore. I simply have to trust the Holy Spirit to guide me and the rest of the church into what is necessary, what is true, what is right. And I'll pray fervently that I don't make too many mistakes along the way and that the ones I do make, well, I'll be forgiven. I pray for that too. And I pray for you, Martin, for your safety, for peace of your conscience, and for the faithfulness to the word of God that holds you captive. Well, oh. I must go now. Well, thank you, Father. It's been great to see you again. Yes. Have courage, my son, and remember this, that as you leave this man-made fortress, there's another who goes with you and will never leave you. Ah, yes. <laughs> Psalm 46. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. That's nice. I should write a song about that. Farewell, Father. Farewell. Go in peace, my son. I will see you in my prayers. Luther wrote 12 books while in hiding. 
Most of them were for common people to help them understand God's love for them. Luther's greatest writing at Warburg was a translation of the New Testament from Greek into German. Luther's was not the first translation into Greek, but it was the first one to use ordinary language that common people could understand. Later, Luther also translated the Old Testament from Hebrew into German. He was always committed to bringing the word of God to every person. On March 6, 1522, Luther left Wartburg Castle and returned to his home in Wittenberg. This was not safe. He was still considered to be an outlaw. But mobs and riots were breaking out in Wittenberg. Luther's teachings were causing chaos. At the urging of Wittenberg's leaders, Luther returned. His return managed to quell the violence, but Luther saw what great instability lay on the horizon. Bigger trouble was brewing. There was no turning it all back. Luther was an elderly man, or an earthly man, who spoke his mind in blunt language. Many of his comments, recorded for example in Table Talk, were down to earth and provocative. This endeared him to the German public, who regarded him as one of the best orators of his day. Many of his comments grew out of specific circumstances, and Luther never intended them to be turned into systematic dogmatics, which other Lutherans did, beginning with Philip Melanchthon. Luther emphasized human fallibility, both of priests and believers, and therefore, through constant preaching, hearing the word, and continual study of the Bible, God would reveal himself in fragments. Hence, many feel there is a big difference between Luther and Lutheranism, just as there is between Christ and Christianity. Luther would probably not recognize the Lutheran church that was, against his wishes, named for him, and had never intended his legacy to be turned into a type of orthodoxy. Luther initiated a reformation in Western civilization that combined with the Renaissance paved the way for the modern democratic world. While demanding obedience to his teachings and his princes, he planted the idea that people were ultimately accountable to God and should glorify him through their work. This unleashed a productive worth ethic and self-reliance that led to great creativity and prosperity. Protestants particularly flourished in the Netherlands and the United States, where there was religious freedom.